Hey, hello and welcome back. So this is going to be a bit of a brief introduction on the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy's Zephyr Streamliners as a piece of equipment and a little brief discussion on some of their less memorable Zephyr trains that ran along the Burlington system. I will be reserving videos, um, or at least some Zephyr routes, for their own separate videos, most notably the Twin City Zephyr, the California Zephyr, the Denver Zephyr, and then the joint um, Rock Island CB and Q service in Texas. Those will be getting their own video. I forgot to do those disclaimers in some past videos, such as the one on the Santa Fe, where that is a, um, the Texas chief will be eventually someday getting its own video, probably around the same time I do the CB and Q and Rock Island services in Texas. But that is not on the, on the drawing board yet. So this will be at least getting us into a bit of a series about services in the Midwest after moving to the East following the um, Empire Builder and the North Coast Limited and the other trains that I talked about that ran between the Pacific Northwest and Chicago. The Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy was one of the Granger railroads that ran the Midwest. It connected Chicago to St. Paul and as far away as Texas and Colorado, among other areas of the West, or at least Midwest. It was a major East-West railroad that was eventually brought under the auspices of James J. Hill, as mentioned in past videos, and it became the link between his railroads and the East. Among its slogans was Everywhere West. The earliest part of the Burlington that I could find was records on a railroad called the Aurora Branch Railroad, which was meant to connect Aurora, Illinois, to a line serving, serving Chicago. This railway was chartered in 1848 by the state of Illinois, and by 1870, this railroad had lines crisscrossing Illinois, Iowa, and Missouri. It even carried mail for the Pony Express to St. Joseph, Missouri. And following the Civil War, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy fell under the control of an investor named John Murray Forbes and Charles Elliott Perkins, who Perkins was the guy I believe actually doing the day-to-day -day operation and uh, Forbes was more of an investor. Under these two men, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy tripled in size and became a formidable railroad in the Midwest. Perkins ran the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy for 20 years, and in 1901 is when Harriman and Hill started fighting over control of the railroad. Perkins also thought the cb &Q needed to be part of a transcontinental system to ensure its long-term survival. As mentioned a couple videos ago, Hill ended up sealing the deal with Perkins and the Great Northern and Northern Pacific eventually split a 97% stake in the Burlington and it was held as a quasi-subsidiary of the two, much like the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle on the western end of its system until the Burlington Northern merger in 1970. So skipping ahead a bit the, to the 1930s, the Burlington was a leading railroad and is often credited with being one of the two railways that kicked off the streamlined craze in 1934. This happened because the Burlington was worked with Bud to build a train set called the Pioneer Zephyr. The Pioneer Zephyr was a piece of equipment similar to the M10,000 Streamliner, which I believe came a few weeks later, or if not a few months later. The Zephyr was a three-car train set that was fully articulated and made of stainless steel. The sleek train evokes speed and modernity. God, I always have a problem pronouncing that word with its aesthetics. This train was shorter than, than the competing M10,000, but the Burlington under Ralph Budd, no relation to the Budd company, Budd, ran a PR stunt to promote the train. This train ran between Chicago and Denver in what was called the Dawn to Dusk Run. This train was um, named after Zephyrus, the Greek god of the West Wind, and this PR stunt and the Burlington expanding its fleet of Zephyrs helped Budd, the rail manufacturer, not the CEO, truly become a, a competitor to Pullman. The Zephyr as a piece of equipment was revolutionary at the time. It was diesel powered, which was still a new technology for trains at the time, made of stainless steel, but it came with some cost. It was more expensive to buy these trains, but they were cheaper to maintain than conventional steam trains were. The original Zephyr was a three section train that was 197 feet long and could seat 72 passengers, which was less than the M10,000, which could carry just short of 120 people. The capacity of this train was basically the modern equivalent of one Amtrak Horizon car capacity-wise, and there were, of the three sections, they were as followed, a railway post office, a baggage car coach combine, and a coach lounge, which I believe is where the food service area was. This train was powered by two 600 horsepower Winton 201A engines. For comparison, a Genesis engine puts out 4,200 horsepower, so this is a 1,200 horsepower train. This train was conceived after Ralph Budd of the Burlington Northern, or Burlington 
Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, sorry, wrong railway, and Edward Budd of the Budd Company talked about the future of passenger trains. Rolf wanted to increase the speed and efficiency of passenger trains, and Edward wanted to use new technology, specifically the Budd Company's work with stainless steel, to make a new generation of trains. And the Zephyr, the Pioneer Zephyr, was the culmination of this work. The first Zephyr train set was completed on April 7th, 1934, and went into testing on the Reading Railroad in the two weeks following its completion. On April 18th, the train was hauled into Philadelphia's Broad Street Station for the public to see, and it was a very quick hit. This popularity got the Boston to Maine to order its own identical train called the Flying Yankee for its railroad. The Pioneer Zephyr left Philadelphia for Chicago, and it arrived on May 10th after touring the Midwest to show off the future of passenger trains to the people of the Midwest. Two weeks after it arrived and the Burlington got to test it themselves is when it went on its uh, 13-hour dawn to dusk run on May 26, 1934. This event is what is credited as fully kicking off the streamline craze of the 1930s and eventually post-war as well. So much of the public got to see the first Zephyr <clears throat> and it set a speed record that people wanted more trains similar to it. This is what also led Bud to becoming a serious passenger car manufacturer in the following years and up Honestly, through the first decade of Amtrak's existence, it was um, still producing cars well into the 1980s, which is, um, I think Pullman just barely lasted that long with the help of Amtrak. About a year after the Dawn to Dusk run, a dinette coach was added to the Pioneer Zephyr, which increased the capacity to 112. This success led the CB&Q to order eight more Zephyr train sets to make regional runs across the CB&Q system, which were numbered 9901 to 9908. Four of them were assigned to the Twin City Zephyr, one was became the Mark Twain Zephyr, two of them became the Denver Zephyr and were eventually replaced with a full train set, and one of them it was the General Persing Zephyr. This isn't to say that these were the only trains to carry the name Zephyr. Many other trains carried the name, but most notably to this day even, the California Zephyr is probably the more famous of them considering Amtrak still carries the name to some extent. Actually, I think it is, other than like from Winnemucca into California, I actually do think it runs almost entirely the original route, but different um, subject for different video. Many other trains carried the name, um, sorry. But these other trains were standard diesel powered trains. Before we get into what the train sets themselves did later in life, let's talk about some of the routes that they ran. The original Pioneer Zephyr was assigned to run between Kansas City and Lincoln, Nebraska. It departed Lincoln at seven in the morning and returned in the evening 12 hours later. The Mark Twain Zephyr ran between St. Louis, Missouri and Burlington, Iowa via Hannibal, Missouri, which was the hometown of Mark Twain, which is where the train set actually got its name. The, this train is the most interesting history considering after its time with the CB&Q, it bounced around between various private owners until recently, and as of July 2020, it's owned by the Wisconsin Great Northern Railway, which is a tourist railway around, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Trago, Wisconsin, it, that is currently attempting to restore the train and get it into running condition again. For a time, the Mark Twain Zephyr and sister of the General Pershing ran between St. Louis and Kansas City in conjunction with the Alton Road. This train was called the Ozark State Zephyr, and the train ran twice a day in each direction. They had a morning and an afternoon train like its counterpart, the Twin City Zephyr. The General per Pershing made the morning run out of St. Louis, and the Mark Twain made the morning run out of Kansas City, and then they switched. This train was discontinued in 1939, and one major difference between the General Pershing and the other Zephyrs was that it wasn't articulated. It was made of individual cars because at the time the CB&Q came to the conclusion that they preferred the flexibility over a fixed train set. It and it is and was the more difficult to add and remove cars from a fixed train set than it is to do so from a regular train. And from what I understand, most of the other Zephyr sets were the other Zephyr train sets had a similar setup where the engine section could actually be removed from the rest of the train. But the last one was the one where the cars were fully separated. And in another addition to the Zephyrs was the Zephyrettes. This was a group of all-female hosts for the Zephyr trains. The Zephyrettes were, um, in a sense, the like airline steward, the babysitter, tour guides, registered nurses of the train. They were conceived by Velma McPeak, who worked in the CB&Q's passenger division as a way to attract women to the rails and families more generally. As mentioned, they were, they were required to have a college degree or be nurses between the ages of 24 and 28, between 5'4 and 5'8. Yeah, they, they really could have specific requirements in these days because, uh, you know, no, there weren't any non-discrimination laws, so they could have these kind of weird requirements or these what someone like me who was born in the 90s and grew up in the 2000s has a hard time understanding as being um, an acceptable thing to ask. 
They also weren't allowed to smoke or drink on board. The Zephyrettes first appeared on the Denver Zephyr in 1936 and spread to the other trains until World War II started. The position was eliminated during the war because the railways were required to operate the most bare services to conserve resources such as labor that could be used to work in war industries. The position wasn't revived until 1949 when the California Zephyr was launched. At this time, the Zephyrettes were actually Western Pacific employees instead of CB and Q employees, and the Zephyrettes were created after the Santa Fe and other railways, um, I think the UP was the other main one that did this, started hiring nurse stewardesses on their trains to better accommodate families. As the Depression wore on, most railways saw families as the way passenger trains would survive long term, and the CB and Q did this by hiring their own nurses and elevating women to prominent positions within the company. Velma McPeak, her short little rundown in her bio was that she was a school teacher. She had managed a tea room and an apartment store um, before working at the passenger division of the CB&Q. And um, I'm going to put a little bit of a pin on this here as this is going to be a topic for like railroad or railroading in the depression, some of the innovations they uh, had to try to keep the trains going. So put a little pin in that one till then. The Zephyr train sets face declines like every other passenger train in the United States. The original Pioneer Zephyr was retired on the 26th anniversary of its dawn to dusk run. And from what I could find, most of the sets were retired within a year or so of, of this date. The Pioneer Zephyr was donated to the Science Museum of Chicago and so have some others, excluding the Mark Twain Zephyr, which, as I said, is currently undergoing restoration work in Wisconsin. The Zephyr trains did continue in name, at least until the creation of Amtrak, and Amtrak did preserve the name by running the San Francisco Zephyr and later renaming it the California Zephyr once they could run over the Rio Grande portion of the line. And currently, I do not believe there are any serious plans to relaunch any train service on the former um, Zephyr routes that don't currently have service at least none that I am aware of at this time, so I, I'm sure someone has probably said that they want one back but never actually acted on it because that happens a lot. But anyways, before I go on a whole diatribe about advocacy or something, um, in the next video I'll be talking about the Rock Island Rockets, one of the Burlington's competitors in the Midwest and a fellow Granger Railroad. I will also be talking about how it formed along with some of the other lesser rocket trains in their short little video. At some point, I also be doing a much longer, well, there's your problem, quote unquote, style video on the Granger Railways and why some of them failed and others survived. And this is more or less going to be a bonus video and not part of my regular one video every other week schedule, um, unless I take a sabbatical and just kind of slot it in somewhere. So anyways, um, hope you enjoyed and we'll come back for the next one where I do talk about the Rock Island and its rockets and that you... Um, yeah, do the YouTube things like sharing, subscribing, commenting down below, telling me how much I suck. I know. <laughs> Anyways, I will see you in the next one.